Mount USA. You're listening to BostonFreeRadio.com. Hello and welcome to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. Words on Film is a show to which you are listening on bostonfreeradio.com and WBCALP Boston. You're watching and listening to me on Somerville Community Access Television or some community TV station that's kind enough to pick up this broadcast. And to them, I say thank you as always. Or you're watching and listening to me on Facebook Live, either on my own personal page or on Boston Free Radio's Facebook page. Either way, you could join me. I'm glad you could join me to discuss my favorite topic, which is movies. And for today's edition of Words on Film, I am reviewing three movies that have just been released in theaters this past weekend. But before I get into those reviews, let's start with my usual segment, which is What's Topping the Box Office? This is the... This is a breakdown of the top 10 highest grossing films of this past weekend. Some of them are hits, some of them are flops, some of them are yet to be hits, but I will let you know the difference as I go down the list. And as predicted, the number one movie at the box office for this past weekend is Venom, which is a Marvel Comics movie. What connection it has to the Marvel Cinematic Universe, I will tell you when I review the film after the next break. And this weekend, Venom, against a budget of ranging from $100 to $116 million, grossed $80.3 million here at home and $205.5 million around the world. And it is probably going to gross a lot more than that. In fact, my guess is that next week it is also going to be number one, but of course we'll have to wait and see. A Star is Born, the latest remake starring Bradley Cooper, also directed by Bradley Cooper, and Lady Gaga, is number two at the box office, also debuting this week. And against a budget of $76 million, A Star is Born has so far grossed a total of $42.9 million at home this weekend and $58.5 million worldwide, which includes the United States and Canada. So while it's not a hit yet, it is still off to a very good start, especially given its comparatively modest budget to Venom. Smallfoot was number two at the box office last week. This week it slid slightly to number three, which is not a bad slide, especially given its competition. But this week, Smallfoot debuted, or excuse me, made $14.4 million at the box office. Against a total budget of $80 million, that's $80 million, Smallfoot has so far grossed $42.3 million here in the States and $75.3 million worldwide, making it neither a hit here in the States or around the world, but around the world is very close to becoming at least a tentative hit, and Smallfoot has a long way to go but to become either a tentative hit and certainly a certified hit, but of course we'll have to see if it's succeeds. Night School was number one at the box office last week when it debuted. This week it slid to number four, which doesn't bode very well for the movie's word of mouth, but it, it grossed a decent $12.5 million here in the States and Canada. Against a budget of $29 million, though, Night School has so far grossed $47 million here at home in the U.S. and Canada, and around the world it has grossed $59 million. So even though it went from number one to number four, particularly given its modest budget, it actually is very close to becoming a certified hit here in the States. It's a tentative hit for now. And around the world it has already reached certified status. So it should probably reach certified status by next week here in the States and, of course, vicariously abroad. The House with a Clock in Its Walls is also a movie that fell slightly, but it is in its third week in release, and it should probably stay in theaters through Halloween. At least I'm predicting it will. But it slid from number three last week to number five this week, having made $7.3 million at the U.S. and Canadian box office this past weekend. Against a budget of $42 million, The House with a Clock in Its Walls has so far grossed $55.1 million here in the States and $89.9 million worldwide, making it a tentative hit here in the States and around the world it is a certified hit. And my guess is that, especially come around Halloween time, it should reach the status of certified hit. At least I'm predicting it. I might be wrong. 
A Simple Favor, starring Anna Kendrick and Blake Lively, is also one of those films that's kind of bubbling underneath the surface. I don't think it was ever number one, but I, I don't have my records to go that far to confirm that. But it grossed $3.4 million at the U.S. and Canadian box office this past weekend. Against a budget of $20 million, A Simple Favor has so far grossed $49 million here in the States and $76.4 million worldwide, making it a certified hit here in the States and around the world just barely. The Nun is a movie that's doing extremely well. In fact, I would go as far as to say that its international gross is exceeds every single movie on this list except for one so far. But it grossed $2.7 million at the U.S. and Canadian box office this past weekend. Against a budget of just $22 million, The Nun has so far grossed $113.5 million here in the States and $347.2 million worldwide. Of course, it goes without saying that it is a certified hit here in the States and around the world. Crazy Rich Asians is number eight at the box office, sliding slightly from number seven last week, but already Crazy Rich Asians has broken the box office record for being the highest grossing romantic comedy of all time, not adjusted to inflation. So, very good for Crazy Rich Asians. And while it made $2.2 million at the U.S. and Canadian box office this past weekend, Against a budget of $30 million, Crazy Rich Asians has so far grossed $169.2 million here in the States and $226.2 million worldwide, making it needless to say, a certified hit here in the States and a certified hit around the world. Hellfest is a movie that is struggling despite coming out on Halloween and having a modest budget of $5.5 million. This past weekend, it grossed $2.1 million, but against a budget of, as I said, $5.5 million, Hellfest has so far grossed $8.9 million here in the States and 90, not, excuse me, $9.6 million worldwide, making it a tentative hit here in the States and around the world, but especially given the subject matter, it probably should be doing better, but it should reach certified status by next week. Hopefully it'll still be in the top 10 because I actually really like this film. And finally, number 10 at the box office is the remake of The Predator. Having made just under a million dollars, actually $0.9 million this past weekend in the States and Canada. Against a budget of $88 million, though, The Predator has so far only made $50 million here in the States and $123.2 million worldwide. So even though it is a tentative hit around the world, it is struggling statewide and in Canada. Not completing high school is more of a social thing than it was an academic thing. Even though all these years have passed, I still had that longing to have my diploma. At age 30, Carissa finished her high school diploma. If you're even considering getting your high school diploma, you can do it. No one gets a diploma alone. If you're thinking of finishing your high school diploma, you have help. Find free adult education classes near you at finishyourdiploma.org. That's finishyourdiploma.org. Brought to you by the Dollar General Literacy Foundation and the Ad Council. Never Stop the Madness, Tuesdays at 9 p.m., bostonfreeradio.com. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The first movie I'll be reviewing for you today is Venom, which is the long-awaited anti-hero film based on the mama based on the Marvel Comics character of the same name. And this movie has been produced by Sony and Columbia Pictures in association with Marvel. And it is not yet, or at least not at the moment, um, a film that, even though it's based on a Marvel Comics character, is set in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. I guess it was intended initially to be, part of the MCU, but as you'll see in this movie, there's no mention of Spider-Man, there's no mention of any of the Avengers, and at the moment, I think its inclusion in the Marvel Cinematic Universe is still kind of up for debate because its status as you watch the film is pretty ambiguous. It doesn't even take place in the same city that in which Peter Parker lives. 
In fact, it takes place on the opposite side of the continent in San Francisco, California, where we meet a venturing journalist by the name of Eddie Brock, who in this movie is played by the great actor Tom Hardy, who has never been nominated for an Academy Award from what I can recall, but he's certainly one of the greatest actors probably never to have been nominated. But that may change in a couple of years. Either way, he is a risk-taking actor who is certainly taking a risk by doing this film. And Eddie Brock is a journalist who gets fired because of a controversial piece he does on an enterprising scientist. But after he acquires the powers of a symbiote, he will have to release his alter ego Venom to save his life and also ultimately the life of everyone on Earth. So Eddie Brock in this movie is somebody who is, at least at first, not associated with Spider-Man. And he actually probably isn't even aware of Spider-Man's existence. He is a journalist who works for a big conglomerate, but he is warned by his supervising boss that he should not question or give any hardball questions to an enterprising entrepreneur by the name of Carlton Drake, who in this movie is played by Reese Ahmed. And ultimately, Eddie Brock finds some incriminating information on on Carlton Drake from his girlfriend, who is a lawyer named Anne Wang, who is played by Michelle Williams. And even though Eddie Brock combs through his girlfriend's papers without asking her permission, he still finds some incriminating evidence about Carlton Drake and his controversial scientific studies. When he confronts Carlton Drake about this, he is immediately fired by his supervisor, and also his girlfriend is super uh, is, is fired from the law firm that represents Carlton Drake and his company. So ultimately... Eddie Brock loses his job, he loses his girlfriend, and he is down and out in San Francisco. But ultimately, a scientist that works for Carlton, Carlton Drake, whose name is Dr. Dora Skirth, who's played in this movie by Jenny Slate, whistleblows on her boss and ultimately tells Eddie Brock that his suspicions were absolutely correct and that Carlton Drake has been using human test subjects to study a symbiote that came crashing down here from planet Earth. And when Eddie Brock begins to save one of these patients that has been unfortunately infected by the symbiote, he himself becomes infected by the symbiote, which is this gooey black substance that ultimately has a personality. And that personality is, of course, Venom. So, Eddie... What was the name of that character again? Eddie Brock begins to have this Jekyll and Hyde type relationship with both himself and this unknown symbiote from another planet who crash landed on a planet Earth for some reason. And ultimately, he finds that in order for himself to live, he has to keep Venom alive for better or for worse. So the tagline of Venom is the world has enough superheroes. But actually, while Venom in this movie is set up as an anti-hero, very similar to Deadpool in both of his movies, he's not a supervillain, or at least not yet. There is one inevitable uh, extra scene, which I won't give away, during the credits that suggests that Venom might go towards the dark side with the help of another person whose name nor the role they play I'll give away, but it's one of those things where you have to see the film for its, for yourself to find out. But I was incredibly impressed by Venom. Even though I was a little wary about Venom ultimately becoming a hero, albeit an anti-hero, and not going straight towards the villain part, and even though I was a little disappointed not to see other Marvel comic superheroes come into this movie... I did appreciate Venom for what it was, which is not only a well-acted film, thanks to the 
lead performances by Tom Hardy, Michelle Williams, and Riz Ahmed. And Riz Ahmed seems like probably the least likely villain of the film, but he certainly is reminiscent of some Silicon Valley entrepreneurs. And (laughs) some of them may actually have a dark side to them, but I'm not at liberty to say which ones because I don't know them personally. But (laughs) I think any similarity to people living or dead is entirely coincidental as they tell you at the very end of the credits which of course i stayed for to see the extra scenes that actually do crop up both at the very end of the credits and also somewhere in the middle but venom was unexpectedly funny as a matter of fact when you hear the voice of venom speaking in eddie brock or tom hardy's character's head he actually does have some pretty funny things to say even though he doesn't say very much and of course it wouldn't be worth mentioning this marvel comics movie without mentioning that the special effects on venom and how he embodies the character that Tom Hardy plays is indeed incredible. Certainly a step up from Spider-Man 3, which even though it had very impressive special effects, the story wasn't quite there, but Venom certainly makes up for what Spider-Man 3 lacked, and it gets my rating of a knockout. Even though this is a movie where I expected the film to turn really, really dark in that I expected Venom and Eddie Brock to actually go towards the villain side, I still enjoyed the film, even though it, it sort of deviated from what I expected it to be, but then again, I think this is a movie that people will keep watching again and again, even though it's not part of the MCU officially. Driving means freedom, exploration, fun, pride, flexibility, flexibility. friendship, Escape. independence, distracted driving means danger, recklessness, irresponsible, chaos, police, Devastation. injury, Tears. death, safe driving means staying alert and staying alive. Visit StopTextStopRex.org, a message brought to you by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, Project Yellow Light, Noise, and the Ad Council. Welcome to Mr. Bear's Violet Hour Saloon, where the sky is evening gorgeous, the drinks won't cloud your head, and the cocktail nuts are poems. Join me, Mr. Bear, every Tuesday at 8 p.m. Boston time on bostonfreeradio.com for music, poetry, fiction, interviews, and more, making the lonely a little more bearable. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is A Star is Born, which is a remake of a remake of a remake of a a film that came out in 1937, starring Robert Carson, Dorothy Parker, and Alan Campbell. Of course, it was remade into probably its most famous incantation in 1954, starring Judy Garland and James Mason, and then again in 1976, starring Barbara Streisand and Chris Christopherson and just about everyone I've spoken to has seen at least one of these stars born movies I haven't actually met anyone who saw the original one from 1937 but a lot of people are familiar with the 1954 movie which controversially did not earn Judy Garland an Academy Award for Best Actress in a Leading Role, although that's seen as one of the biggest Oscar snubs in history. But, of course, seeing that it was 68 years... 68. Yeah, 64 years ago, I think people have gotten over it by now. But there are a lot of people who also have a soft spot for the Barbara Streisand 1976 version. So to remake iconic films, particularly one that's been remade twice already, if you don't count this one, is certainly a risky move, but somehow director Bradley Cooper, who also stars in this movie, pulls it off and pulls it off so well. I I went into this movie not expecting very much. After all, you have not only Bradley Cooper in it, but you have Lady Gaga, who has acted some in her career, but a lot of her movie and TV credits have been, with a few exceptions, her playing herself. This is not only her first starring role in a film, but it's also one where she plays a character that's not exactly herself, although she certainly has a lot in common with Allie in this film, her her character, but probably not as ostentatious a... (laughs) 
not as ostentatious a dresser as she is in in her <laughs> in her stage life. But in any event, a movie with Lady Gaga in it, you'd expect the music to be great, and it certainly is. And for those of you who are familiar with the story, it's A Star Is Born is about. A musician who helps a young singer and actress find fame, even as age and alcoholism send his own career into a downward spiral. And you would expect Bradley Cooper to act well in this film, and he most certainly does. I think this is probably his first role not only where he directs himself, this is his directorial debut, and what a debut, but it's also unquestionably his saddest role. And... Well, I, I, I sort of gave that away in the downward spiral part, but it is quite heartbreaking to see the turn that Bradley Cooper's character takes, especially when it's revealed that not only is he an alcoholic and part-time drug addict, but also his father, who was not quite as successful as Bradley Cooper's character uh, Jackson Maine is in this film, uh, Jackson Maine is a very famous singer and musician in this cinematic universe. But unfortunately, Jackson's past catches up with him. And even though he has a surrogate father in a roadie by the name of Bobby, who's played by Sam Elliott, it still doesn't help a lot of things. And you would expect that... Lady Gaga's character, Allie, being more down-to-earth and certainly starting from the bottom, would probably put more perspective in Jackson Maine's life. And whether or not she is successful, I won't entirely give away. But what I will say is not only is the music great and just about every supporting performance in this movie phenomenal, but it also has moments of heartbreak and there were times where I was actually tearing up while watching the film and so was every single person who was in the theater with me in fact when the the credits started rolling I don't think there was a dry eye in the theater and that says a lot certainly not only coming from an actor making his directorial debut but also having at least two very tough acts to follow with a star is born having been remade the several times that it was. And full disclosure, I have not, I personally have not actually seen any of the previous A Star is Born movies. Not the original, not the Judy Garland version, and not the Barbara Streisand version. So I unfortunately can't make comparisons, but on the plus side, that is an advantage in my part because I can judge this film for what it is and not compare Lady Gaga to Barbara Streisand or Judy Garland. But actually, now that I think about it, Lady Gaga does have a lot in common with Garland and Streisand in that not only is she a a very successful singer who also has successfully transitioned into movies, but she also, like Barbara Streisand, like Judy Garland, has a huge following in the gay community. And there's actually one scene in this film that I thought was probably one of Lady Gaga's best scenes where she's undiscovered, but Jackson Maine, Bradley Cooper's character, wanders into a gay bar, not because he's gay or curious, but because he's an alcoholic and just settles for the first bar he finds. And Lady Gaga turns in this incredible rendition of La Vie en Rose, which is actually in the, its native French that Lady Gaga sings. And yes, she's a woman, and yes, she's performing in a drag bar, but she owns the place. And certainly when she when Jackson Maine starts to develop her as an artist, it, you can certainly see that Lady Gaga has not only the on-stage pe- presence, but also the on-screen presence to pull this off. And Lady Gaga, for somebody who has not been in many other films, except for maybe a couple of Robert Rodriguez sequels, which were forgettable, and certainly hired Lady Gaga for her namesake alone, not for her acting ability, Lady Gaga did a phenomenal job, not only singing, but acting. And her chemistry with Bradley 
Cooper in this movie was mesmerizing. So I didn't expect much from this remake, even you know, considering that it's the fourth remake of a, a classic film, or rather the third remake of a classic film, fourth in total. But it gets my rating of a knockout, and you will definitely be seeing this movie get nominated for a number of Oscars, certainly in the music category, in the original music category, come Oscar season. And Oscar buzz being mid-October or early October right now is certainly picking up, and A Star is Born will most definitely get some nominations, I'm sure. I'm voting in the midterm elections because my constitutional right. Because my ancestors died. And to make it better for my children. The women before me fought. So we can remain free. Helping your community out. Midterm elections. No, every vote makes a difference. My opinion matters. I vote. I vote. I vote in the midterm elections. Register now on IamAVoter.com. And don't forget to vote Tuesday, November 6th. Brought to you by I Am A Voter and the Ad Council. Hey, 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 it's Genevieve, a.k.a. Miss Fab 617. And it's your girl, Crystal, a.k.a. The Crystal Lens. We're coming to you from our new show called Boston, Boston Come, Come Through. Through. We'll be bringing you the latest and greatest things happening in and around Boston. We'll be talking what? Black-owned businesses, hey. social events, what? And the Black Experience. Okay. How's that sound, Genevieve? I love it. Dig it. Tune in every Wednesday at 9 p.m. Eastern Time on Boston Free Radio. Boston, come through. Come listen. Welcome back to Words on Film on Boston Free Radio the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. And Words on Film is also on WBCALP Boston. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is The Old Man and the Gun, which tells the true story of Forrest Tucker and his audacious escape from San Quentin at the age of 70 to an unprecedented string of heists that confounded authorities and enchanted the public. This movie takes pr place predominantly in 1981 when Forrest Forrest Tucker, who's played in this movie by Robert Redford, is well into his prime, but is still robbing banks with ease. And, and considering that has been what he's done all his life, in addition to escaping from prison, he is very good at it. And the old man in the gun is significant in the sense that Robert Redford is stating that, or has stated in interviews, that this is going to be his very last movie as he's retiring. And he should retire. After all, he is 82 years old, even though he is, I mean, he certainly shows signs of aging, but he, he, has looks that are a lot of people who are probably around 55 to 75 would most certainly envy. But at 82, I don't entirely blame him for calling it quits. He's had a very impressive movie career. He's had 78 IMDb credits for acting alone. And even though it's a little it's a little bit of a shame for him to retire after his comeback all is lost, I think he certainly deserves it. And very much like Forrest Tucker, Robert Redford kind of goes out with a bang with this film. Very much like a lot of his classic roles in movies like Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid and The Sting, he plays a career criminal, but a very likable career criminal. He's not murdering, he's only robbing banks, but then again he is stealing, so... He is indeed an anti-hero, probably even more so than Venom, arguably, but he, he certainly has the audience on his side, or at least I was on his side during this movie. But the movie is wrought with irony, and of course Robert Redford plays Forrest Tucker with such ease, or such seeming ease, and certainly Forrest Tucker's fate changes when he meets a woman by the name of Jewel, who in this movie is played by Sissy Spacek. So, so as not to go back to jail, Forrest Tucker reveals himself as a salesman by the name of Bob Callahan, but eventually Sissy Spacek's character finds out the truth, particularly when Forrest Tucker is conspiring with two members of a gang of his called the Over the Hill Gang. They are comprised of Teddy, who's played by Danny Glover, and Waller, played in a usual scene-stealing performance by Tom Waits, as they attempt to knock off one of the biggest banks in Dallas, Texas. Of course, Forrest Tucker does have one policeman on his trail, who is a Dallas police officer and detective by the name of John Hunt, who is played in this movie by Casey Affleck. 
And even though Casey Affleck has fallen into some controversy, particularly in, uh, revolving around the Me Too movement, I don't think that people who know about Casey Affleck's alleged indiscretions on movie sets are necessarily going to dislike him in this film. But, of course, his private life certainly hasn't helped over the last couple of years, even after winning a much-deserved Best Actor Oscar for the excellent film Manchester by the Sea, which is another tearjerker. I was just talking about A Star is Born. But, yeah, Manchester by the Sea is also not an easy film to watch. This one is much easier. And one of the things I really enjoyed about this film was Robert Redford primarily, but I also really enjoyed the dynamic Catch Me If You Can between him and Casey Affleck's character. In fact, there are certain ironic scenes where Forrest Tucker, played by Robert Redford, doesn't seem to really care whether or not he's caught, or at least takes some risks that maybe some more novice criminals probably wouldn't take. But of course, Forrest Tucker in this film is a seasoned professional. And I would think that there are moments in this movie that are fabricated and certainly some characters in this film that are composite characters i think that john hunt is an actual law enforcement agent and of course forrest tucker was a real bank robber who died in prison in 2004 i guess old habits are pretty hard to break but i'm pretty convinced that sissy spacek danny glover and tom waits characters in addition to others are composites because they tell you at the onset of this film that this film also and i'm quoting this film also is mostly true end quote and the fact that they started out with this film also is kind of strange because they don't tell you something before they say also. They don't even show the title of the movie. They just start with this film also is mostly true. And you would also expect that they would tell you if they say it's mostly true, they would tell you exactly what parts aren't true. But that didn't exactly disappoint me. As a matter of fact, I still thought the film told an excellent story, and Robert Redford was both daring and charming, as you would expect from films he's in. And what a way to go out if he is, in fact, retiring from film. I think probably later on in the next couple of years, provided hopefully he doesn't die soon, he will probably make uh, cameos here and there in certain films, but man, if, if this is a film to end on, then I would say what a great career for Robert Redford. I wouldn't go as far as to say that Robert Redford deserves an Academy Award nomination for this role, but given his career in films and the fact that despite being a, a indomitable box office presence over the last 50 years, my guess, and he's only been nominated once for Best act Actor in The Sting, and nothing else. Not All is Lost, not Butch Cassidy, not All the President's Men. My guess is the Academy might give him a nomination, but whether or not he'll win, I don't know. But I was still very impressed with this film. I did think it was fun. I thought both the both his being chased literally and figuratively was worth watching, and it does get my rating of a knockout. It's not one of Robert Redford's best films, but it certainly comes very close to a lot of his. And... It's, it's too bad that Paul Newman wasn't alive to share the screen with Robert Redford. But then again, what part would he play? The one that Tom Waits fills in? I don't think so. <laughs> juice, Mom. Juice, juice, juice. Mommy, why are we going to the store? Mom, Mom I want Mommy. juice. Mom. Juice, juice, juice. Mom. Your child will have different needs at different stages of life, and that includes the car seat. See, car crashes are a leading killer of children ages 1 to 13. Protect your child's future at every stage of life. Go to safercar.gov slash the right seat. A message from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council. Boston Free Radio has no corporate agenda. We're independent media for the people. Your music, your voice, your station. Time! 
This is Alan Patterson. I want to invite you all to tune into my music radio show, Voices of Time, heard live each and every Wednesday from 3 to 5 p.m. Eastern Time on Boston Free Radio at bostonfreeradio.com. Voices of Time, while founded on the golden age of music from the 60s and 70s in all its permutations, also visits other eras and many genres. We feature rock and roll from its original era and beyond, rock in all its variations, including prog, psychedelia, garage and punk, Motown, old school R&B, soul, blues, jazz, gospel, folk, old school country, zydeco, all music New Orleans, rockabilly, bluegrass, world music, comedy, poetry, and spoken word, and much more. Please come and join me for an adventurous two-hour ride into the stratosphere of sound where the voices of time reverberate for all eternity. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. And now that I've reviewed all the movies that I have to review for this show, it's time for me to get into a segment I normally get when, uh, whenever I, or I bring up whenever I run out of films, and that's a look at what movies are coming out on DVD and Blu-ray on Tuesday, October 9th. And the biggest film to come out, or arguably the biggest film to come out on this Tuesday, is Hotel Transylvania 3 Summer Vacation, which came out this past summer and certainly has a summer theme to it as the residents of Hotel Transylvania, including Dracula, who runs the place, decide to go on a vacation of which consists of a cruise that is also occupied by other monsters and immortals and it's a movie that i thought was maybe not as good as the first hotel transylvania but certainly better than the second one and i thought that it also had for a movie that's cgi animated a lot of fluidity and lunacy that i haven't seen with a lot of hand or cgi animated films that maybe i have more with hand-drawn animated films particularly or hand-drawn animated shorts particularly those of looney tunes so the hotel transylvania series is probably the closest to the looney tunes sense of fluidity than any other animated film including those of disney pixar have been so far and that's certainly saying a lot i wasn't <laughs> I was very impressed by Hotel Transylvania 3, a lot more than I thought it would be, than I thought I would be, and I, thir- I certainly think that it's a film that is, is good to watch during the summer, but also because of the characters, Dracula, Frankenstein, the mummy, the blob, and all the rest of those creatures, works very well for Halloween. So it's out on DVD and Blu-ray, it's probably out on streaming of some kind, probably on Amazon Prime, so I would recommend picking that movie up for yourself, or renting it on Netflix, or buying it somewhere and it certainly makes great viewing for halloween another movie that's coming out in or rather on blu-ray and dvd and possibly streaming is skyscraper which is the latest from dwayne johnson and i gave this movie a check out when i reviewed it particularly because i did think the characters in the film were strong i loved dwayne johnson in it and i also liked nev campbell who played not only Dwayne Johnson's wife, but also a really good comeback performance for her, or one that's probably slated for a comeback, that did not depict her as somebody who was a damsel in distress, which I appreciated. She is a military doctor who accompanies Dwayne Johnson to this skyscraper in Hong Kong, and I liked the fact that the skyscraper was so ornate and so unique. I mean, it certainly had great set design and it being a literal cliffhanger as Dwayne Johnson finds himself trying to break into the skyscraper, which is on fire and his children and his wife are inside and fearing for their lives. But it also bore a little bit too much similarity to Die Hard which is why I gave it a check out because even though I was thrilled by it and I liked the acting by almost everyone involved except for maybe the people who played the villains because I thought they fell into a little cliche territory, I do think this movie was worth seeing on the big screen and I think on Blu-ray 
if people still rent or buy Blu-rays now, it would look incredible, particularly on a 4K or LED screen. And another movie that's coming out on DVD and Blu-ray right now is an Oscar contender called Eighth Grade, which I reviewed a couple of months ago. It is the directorial debut of Bo Burnham and stars Elsie Fisher in not her debut role, but certainly a role that is her first lead role. And she is a 13-year-old in the eighth grade who is finishing up her final week of middle school, which actually is not particularly a a great week for her. And it certainly was different from my eighth grade week, which was not exactly fun, but I was just elated by the fact that I was getting out of junior high. But there are certain emotions that are brought about in this film which... I certainly appreciated having been somebody who's lived through junior high. I would probably say that of the movies that take place in junior high, of which there aren't as many as you might think, 8th grade is probably the most accurate, given the, the circumstances of the the character Kayla in this film, since Welcome to the Dollhouse. And 8th grade is rated R, but it is a movie that, I would definitely recommend for high schoolers and maybe some older junior high kids. It's rated R for swearing and maybe some sexual content, but I think that younger people will see this movie, especially those who have already been through junior high, and will appreciate it. And it doesn't quite get as dark as Welcome to the Dollhouse, but the same kind of emotions are there. Another movie that's coming out on DVD and Blu-ray and possibly streaming is one called Hotel Artemis, which details the exploits of an underground hospital for criminals, which helps her rehabilitate them during their most dire needs, especially if they've committed a robbery and have just been shot. And Jodie Foster is the lead actress in this film. She does an amazing job. The movie certainly has a kitschy feel to it and is probably one of those films that Quentin Tarantino could have directed and would have done a good job with but Hotel Artemis I believe I gave it my rating of checkout because it's a film that certainly has great set design and really good acting I especially not only liked Jodie Foster but I liked Sterling K. Brown in it I loved Sophia Boutella in it she certainly has a, a vixen role in this film that is Uh, appealing and I also really like Charlie Day in this film playing the comic relief but there was just something about it that was missing but I I still enjoyed it and I think it will eventually be a cult movie and the other film of significance that's coming out on DVD and Blu-ray and will most definitely be out on streaming what channel I don't exactly know be it Netflix or or Hulu or what have you, is the movie Don't Worry, He Won't Get Far on Foot. This movie only made a million dollars during a short run, but it's about a guy by the name of John Callahan, who is an alcoholic, who gets into a car accident and ends up becoming paraplegic, maybe even quadriplegic, I don't quite know. But he starts to draw cartoons to help him cope with his newfound disability. And it certainly has its moments. It's not a great film, but I gave it a marginal recommendation because of Joaquin Phoenix's performance performance today we decided to walk to school the light counted 15 14 31 i mean 13 we took a left on carroll street danny's smart but he gets distracted he realized he forgot his homework i hope he doesn't have another bad day at school when you can see learning and attention issues from their side, you can be on their side. That's why there's understood.org, a free resource for the parents of the one in five kids with learning and attention issues. Go from misunderstanding to understood.org. Brought to you by Understood in the Ad Council. I love those real six sides. They're the ones that move. Intensify and groove me. All the more, I'm unpacking it. Saturdays at noon on Boston Free Radio.
Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. And now that I've reviewed all the films that I have to review for you for the show, it's time to get into my last segment, which for this show will be divided into two parts, which is what's coming up next. This is a spoken word preview of the movies that are coming out in theaters this coming weekend, unless otherwise specified. A lot of them are going to be released nationwide, and I'll let you know which ones I'm going to see, which ones I might skip and which ones might not be coming to a theater near you because of limited release. But the biggest movie that's coming out in theaters this coming weekend looks like an Oscar contender and that one is First Man which is a look at the life of the astronaut Neil Armstrong and the legendary space mission that led him to become the first man to walk on the moon on July 20th, 1969. This movie has Oscar caliber seemingly written all over it. Neil Armstrong is the uh, is played in this movie by Ryan Gosling, and the movie also c- co-stars Claire Foy, Jason Clark, and Kyle Chandler. So this looks like a film that will definitely be on a lot of people's lists, particularly for Oscar contenders. And it is directed by Damien Chazelle, who previously directed La La Land, which almost received Best Picture, I guess because of a a flub. And, of course, he directs Ryan Gosling again in this movie. And, of course, this is Damien Chazelle's only his third movie, but, man, what a start for this guy. And the fact that he did win an Academy Award for Best Director for directing La La Land, which I think he deserved, this is certainly an, an encouraging step in the right direction for Mr. Chazelle. Whether or not First Man is a movie that lives up to its hype or not, I don't know. I'll have to see it. But this is a movie I definitely will see, and I will let you know what I think come next week's show. Another movie that's coming out this coming weekend, just in time for Halloween, is Goosebumps 2 Haunted Halloween. And this movie has Jack Black reprising his role as R.L. Stein from the previous Goosebumps film from three years ago. And just like in that last one, Halloween comes to life in a comedy adventure based on R.L. Stein's 400 million selling series of books. That is pretty much the same storyline as the original one. I can't tell you whether or not it's going to be any more original than or distance itself in some way from the original Goosebumps movie, but of course we'll have to see. The movie also co-stars Wendy McLendon Covey from Bridesmaids and also the TV show The Goldbergs, and Ken Jeong from The Hangover, in addition to other movies and TV shows. I cannot tell you whether or not this movie will be good, but I will definitely see it. It certainly looks like a fun Halloween movie, if that. And I will let you know what I think come next week's show. Another movie that's coming out in the theater nationwide is one that's called Bad Times at the El Royale. This movie looks particularly interesting. It looks... It's like something that Quentin Tarantino or Robert Rodriguez would direct, but instead it's actually directed by Drew Goddard. And it's a movie about seven strangers, each with a secret to bury, who meet at Lake Tahoe's El Royale, which is a rundown hotel with a dark past. Over the course of one fateful night, everyone will have a last shot at redemption before everything goes to hell. This certainly sounds like an intriguing premise, and it has a great cast along with it. It co-stars, or rather it stars, Jeff Bridges, John Hamm, Dakota Johnson, Chris Hemsworth, Manny Jacinto, and two other notable actors who I can't find on my list right now. But Bad Times of the El Royale certainly looks like one of those films that will be maybe a, a sleeper hit or an underground hit. I probably shouldn't call it a sleeper hit because I've seen this movie advertised at movie theaters and also inadvertently on YouTube. And it looks like a a film that certainly would have my attention and I will definitely see it and I will review it for you come next week's show. The other films on this list are ones that are listed as coming out in limited release. So they may or may not come out in a theater near you or I, or their date may be subject to change, even though it's it's slated on this website to come out this coming weekend. But, of course, we'll have to see. There's another movie that looks like an Oscar contender by the name of Beautiful Boy, which is coming out in limited release. It stars Academy Award nominee Steve Carell, Academy Award nominee Timothy Chalamet, Emmy nominee Maura Tierney, and...
and Christian Covery, in addition to Academy Award nominee Amy Ryan. And it's based on the best-selling pair of memoirs from father and son David and Nick Sheff. And Beautiful Boy chronicles the heartbreaking and inspiring experience of survival, relapse, and recovery in a family coping with addiction over many years. It's directed by Felix Van Graningen. That's actually his last name. And it looks pretty serious. And, of course, it's, it's named after a poignant John Lennon song, one of the last ones he ever recorded. And this is a film I definitely want to see. I can't guarantee whether or not I will see it by next week, but I'll certainly seek it out if it's coming, into the, coming out in a theater near me this coming weekend. But if I do review it, I will let you know exactly what I think. Another movie that's coming out this coming weekend is one that's probably not going to be an Oscar contender. It's one called Bigger, and it stars Julianne Huff, Kevin Durant, Colton Hayes, and Tyler Hachlin. It's a movie that is the inspiring tale of the grandfathers of fitness as we now know it, Joe and Ben Welder. And facing anti-Semitism and extreme poverty, the brothers beat all odds to build an empire and inspire future generations. So Bigger seems to be a dramatization of pumping iron before there was pumping iron. Because I don't think that Arnold Schwarzenegger or Lou Ferrigno are going to be characters in this movie. But then again, I might be wrong. But it is a movie about bodybuilding before it became as advanced and as revered as it is today. I mean, now it's a multi-billion dollar enterprise, but I'm very interested to see how this movie turns out. But then again, it is also in limited release. And the fact that it has Julianne Huff as one of the leads in this film isn't particularly encouraging. I mean, Julianne Huff is certainly multi-talented. She's a great dancer, and she's a very good singer. As an actress, though, she's been in movies like the remake of Footloose, Rock of Ages, and Bad Grandpa, all of which were not particularly good, and she wasn't particularly great in them, but I do have the feeling she's going to be in something big pretty soon. Whether it will be bigger or not, I don't know, but this movie may ultimately end up surprising me if I see it. The possibility of lung cancer can be pretty scary, especially if you're one of approximately 8 million current or former smokers at high risk. That's why SaveByTheScan.org wants you to know that now there's a breakthrough low-dose CT scan that can detect lung cancer early, and it only takes 60 seconds. You stop smoking, now start screening. For an easy quiz to see if you're eligible, visit SaveByTheScan.org. It could save your life. SaveByTheScan.org is brought to you by the American Lung Association's Lung Force Initiative and the Ad Council. Every Tuesday at 3, something special happens on Boston Free Radio. Why, it's Toppers with your host, Gil. Toppers, spinning the tunes that today's youth demand. From Justin Bieber to Lady Gaga to the Fleetwoods. And, on occasion, Hoagie Carmichael. If you missed the program, you can check out the archives at Toppers Radio. That's one word, dot blogspot, dot C-O-M. Toppers. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. Continuing with my segment, What's Coming Up Next, are a couple of limited movies that are coming out in limited release. And one of them looks really interesting. It actually is Ike Barinholtz directorial debut, which is called The Oath, and it's a movie he also wrote and in which he stars. And movies that represent the directorial debut of an actor, which they actually direct themselves, are kind of hit or miss. With A Star is Born, it turns out that it, it was a hit for Bradley Cooper, and it's sometimes a hit for Ben Affleck, who directed himself really well in The Town and Argo, but didn't do so well with Live by Night, and also hasn't directed a movie ever since, but he could be up to something, but I'm interested to see how this movie, The Oath, turns out. And Ike Barinholtz, for those who don't know, is a comic actor who is probably best known for acting in the TV show Parks and Recreation, and also most recently in the box office hit Blockers, co-starring Leslie Mann and John Cena. 
But The Oath is a movie that's coming out just in time for Thanksgiving, actually. And in a politically divided America, a man, presumably Ike Barinholtz's character, struggles to make it through the Thanksgiving holiday without destroying his family. And Ike Barinholtz co-stars in this movie along with Tiffany Haddish. And I don't know whether or not... Ike Barinholtz and Tiffany Haddish are married in this movie. I tried actually looking the movie up on IMDb to see if they have the same last name, but IMDb is not giving me the characters' last names. But it would be very interested to see, interesting to see if Tiffany Haddish and Ike Barinholtz characters are married, because that would certainly divide a number of family members. It being an interracial marriage, and we certainly haven't seen the controversies and intricacies of an interracial marriage in a movie for quite some time. We've seen plenty of interracial relationships, but none that elaborate upon the difficulties of such a relationship that are inevitable. But it would be good to see that again, and The Oath is a movie I'm definitely excited for. I'll see anything with Tiffany Haddish in it for sure. And I will let you know what I think about that movie if I see it next week, but I can't guarantee that I will. There are two other movies that are coming out on October 10th, which is Wednesday, and one of them is a movie that looks like it's going to be an Oscar contender. Whether or not it succeeds in being one is debatable, but it's a movie called The Happy Prince, which is another movie that represents, I believe, the directorial debut of Rupert Everett, who also stars in the movie, along with Colin Firth, Emily Watson, and Colin Morgan, amongst other people. And this is the untold story of the last days and the tragic times of Oscar Wilde, a person who observes his own failure with ironic distance and regards the difficulties that beset his life with detachment and humor. So this movie looks like a comedy drama. It's certainly a biography. And while I don't know a lot about Oscar Wilde, certainly the fact that they made a movie out of him it piques my interest. I know a couple of quotes from Oscar Wilde, but I don't know all of his all of his works or what his personality was like, but I hope to find out when, if I see this movie. And another movie that's coming out on October 10th, presumably in limited release, is one that's called Liana. And this is a movie that is actually animated and also a documentary. So it's kind of like I Am Malala in the sense that it's a documentary that incorporates animation within it. And it's about five children in Swaziland who dive into their imaginations to create an original African tale about a girl on a dangerous quest. It's directed by Aaron and Amanda Kopp. And it stars Jacina Milofi. I hope I pronounced that name right. It's certainly been doing pretty well on the festival circuit. It's won a number of awards at festivals like Sundance and Telluride. And I would be interested to see how this film turns out. I, I of course, love documentaries, but ones that incorporate animation are also pretty fascinating. And, and especially with children writing a story, it certainly has its its merits, and it might actually be a contender for Best Documentary at this year's Oscars. I can't guarantee whether or not it will be or even if it'll be good, but it certainly has a lot of assets that are behind it. And I will look out for this film, certainly in my indie theaters. And if I see it, I will let you know what I think come next week's show. And that just about wraps things up for this episode of Words on Film. Words on Film is the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures, and I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The views and opinions expressed on Words on Film, about movies or otherwise, are solely those of your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, i.e. yours truly. They do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of any employees who are working at the station airing this broadcast or the station as a whole. And also as a reminder, you have been listening to Words on Film on bostonfreeradio.com and WBCALP Boston. You have been watching me on SCAT V or some community access TV station that's been kind enough to pick up this broadcast. Or you've been watching and listening to me on Facebook Live, either on my own personal page or on Boston Free Radio's Facebook page. And until the next episode, this is Dan Burke saying, Saying, I'll see you at the movies.